Good morning, church. Um, we are welcome to the feast hurricane edition. I know this is not what any of us anticipated for this Sunday, but uh, I'm glad you're with us. Uh, as you can see, things look a little different. We're a little more informal here. Um, the video is probably a little grainy compared to what you're used to. Uh, we just made a variety of decisions this morning. I did to try to make sure that I could get the most reliable service to you possible. And so um, we're going to do this. It'll be a little different. Uh, I know we've worked on online broadcasting for a year and a half, but at this point that is all very baked into sort of the building and a live setting and uh, taking it all apart and putting it back together over the next week was something I just didn't think was wise. So we're just going to have a special service today. It's going to be like you hanging out with me at my house and uh, it's just going to be a little different in that manner. And I appreciate you guys having patience with us as we try to do the best we can while keeping everybody safe. Most important announcement we have today is if you do have something going on and you do, um, whether uh, here with the hurricane, if you don't feel like you're safe or if you feel like you need help at your house after the winds and everything come, please get in touch with us. We want to take care, good care of each other. We don't want anyone to feel um, like they don't have the support they need. So if you need anything right now, today, or coming up, let us know. Also, if you're watching this, it is pre-recorded, uh, so we can talk in the chat. I'll be there talking with you in the chat, but we will not have the same live element today. Again, that's just to make sure that what we get to you actually gets to you in a timely and appropriate manner. So, uh, A few announcements I did want to talk about. Life will go on uh, next week as normal. We are continuing to not have our feast groups here in August, and so uh, continue to enjoy some time off. But next Sunday, we are starting um, our back to school school giveaway, not just starting it, but hopefully having it. So we have now about 140 kids um, from 65, I think, different families that have signed up for school supplies. All most all those supplies are in. And so next Sunday, what's going to happen is we're going to have a special Sunday. We'd like you all to be there and plan on sticking around. We'll do church from 10 to 11. Church will focus on how we talk to our kids about faith, and we're inviting our friends to come to that if they would like. But then afterwards, at about 1130, people will start showing up, and for the next 90 minutes or so, we'll be giving out all of the school supplies. And uh, we'll have a system for that, but there's a lot that we could use help with if you guys um, can be there. So please uh, be there next week and help us to do this as we continue to relaunch back in the things that really matter for us. Uh, I think that's all the big stuff today. Uh, I hope that you find some measure of peace this morning in worship. Let's pray. God, we thank you so much that you provide for us. We pray that today you will literally be a shelter in the storm for us. Help our state and our city and our, our community here at church to be safe throughout all these things, God. And please help us uh, to care for one another in ways that we should. Thank you so much for Jesus, and it's his name we pray. Amen. So we are very stripped back today. Uh, we, we don't have singing or a communion thought. Uh, everything happened pretty quick. We would encourage you, if you have some time right now, go ahead and take some bread, take some juice, and take a moment to uh, take communion, to remember what Jesus has done for us. Uh, a lot of times we try to put new and interesting spins on this, and it's understandable. We do it week in, week out. But today I just would pray that you remember that communion is about remembering God's care for us, for his covenant with us. That God said that he would be with his people and showed it in Jesus. And so whatever uncertainty or discomfort you're feeling by this coming storm, know that you have a covenant with a God who will not let you go. And so that can be something that really grounds us in this time. I'm going to take a minute here and we'll give you a moment with your families 
to sort of uh, take communion together and then we'll get back in and we'll, we'll, we'll do our sermon time. Imagine a church and it is very quiet and very solemn. Uh, people have come and sat in and they are all mourning the passing of someone they love. People are looking for comfort. They're looking for hope. And so the preacher slowly walks up to the front and begins to talk about resurrection and talk about the hope that Christians have that one day we will all come back to life and be given new bodies when Jesus returns. And in the midst of all of that, the preacher is trying to talk about his understanding of sort of the soul and the body. And he says, all that remains here, pointing to the casket, is the shell. The nut is gone. It's obviously a ridiculous and stupid thing to say at a funeral, right? It's not what he intends to call the departed a nut. But it's funny how even professionals can say really stupid things uh, when they are at a funeral. Funerals are hard. People passing is difficult. And a lot of times we struggle to know what to say or what to do. I asked a group of preachers this week to help me out and tell me their worst stories about things people had said uh, when someone had passed. And some of them were, were funny. Uh, some of them were like that one kind of uh, ridiculous. Um, I had one who told a story uh, about a preacher calling the woman who passed a real Dorcas. And he was referring to Dorcas in the Bible, a great character of the New Testament, and meant it as a compliment her family, who didn't go to church and didn't know who Dorcas was, did not find it so complimentary. And so had to fix that. Uh, another talked about when they were younger, they had a woman who became a widow on Friday afternoon. And on Sunday, as they walked in the door, just instinctively nervous, not sure what to say, the preacher said, how was your weekend? And the woman responded, my husband died. I had a terrible weekend. And he was like, oh, fair enough. That was not the right thing to ask. Some of those stories are a little humorous, but some of them are even more sad uh, or difficult. People told innumerable stories about uh, things that were said that really hurt them and broke their hearts. Uh, sometimes it was just little platitudes, things we say that maybe aren't the best thought through or the most theological we tell them not to worry about it because over time, you know, they'll just forget the spouse. We say it in nice ways like time heals all wounds, but it still means something pretty similar in the end. People say something like, oh, everything happens for a reason. God has a purpose in this. And then sometimes we'll even say things like, well, God needed another angel as if God could not provide for what God needs without killing a spouse. And these things are, are terrible. They scar people. They, they hurt. The most shocking one that I saw was uh, a man who had lost his wife and child. Uh, they had been murdered. And someone came up to them and said, I'm so sorry. I know exactly how you feel. I lost a dog a few years ago. And the pain of those sorts of moments just resonate with these people very clearly. 
long after they're over. The Book of Romans says this, Rejoice with those who rejoice and mourn with those who mourn. And we are called as Christians to be helpful to people who are mourning. And I think we feel that responsibility. I think if you're someone who follows Jesus and you're around people who do not, moments of death are moments where you sort of feel a responsibility that I am supposed to step up. I am supposed to do something special. I'm supposed to be able to help in some way. But the reality is we don't know what we're doing. A lot of times when we walk into a moment of mourning or grieving, it's a little bit like, uh, you know, walking into a room with a, a, an active bomb. Maybe you've seen somebody disarm one on TV, but that doesn't mean you can just go in and start clipping wires. And that's very much the way it feels for some of us. We feel out of our league. We're not sure what to do or how to talk to someone who's grieving. So in this series where we're trying to talk about having better conversations, we thought it would be helpful to talk about how we talk to people who are mourning and how we talk to people who are grieving. And we're going to do that by looking at a story in Jesus' life where Jesus effectively goes to a funeral. Um, I'm really interested in this sermon this week. It was, it was fun to write because it is a story that is very rich with importance about Jesus' resurrection. And the story is very focused on Jesus' coming death and resurrection. It's sort of part of the Passion Week um, in the book of John. And so we really connect the story with bigger questions about the theology of the meaning of the death and resurrection of Jesus. But this week, what I wanted to do and what we're going to do together is to look at this passage through a much simpler lens. It's not that those other things aren't important, but instead of looking at sort of the theology of resurrection, we're going to look at this story just from how do you talk to someone who's mourning? And so I've kind of cut the front and the back off the story, at least how it's told in Sunday school. Uh, Remember, the Bible doesn't have chapters, so, you know, there isn't really a beginning or end to these. We always sort of arbitrarily pick when we start and end. And today we're going to start and end just with the human situation that Jesus walks into and look at how we talk to those who are struggling. So go ahead and read with me. Uh, We're going to start out here in John 11. On his arrival, Jesus found that Lazarus, who was his friend, had already been in the tomb for four days. Now Bethany was less than two miles from Jerusalem, and many Jews had come to Martha and Mary, these are Lazarus' sisters, to comfort them in the loss of their brother. When Martha heard that Jesus was coming, she went out to meet him, but Mary stayed at home. So these are friends of Jesus, Lazarus and his sisters, Mary and Martha. They seem to be very close to Jesus. Some people even have um, put up the hypothesis that in the book of John, there's a character called the disciple whom Jesus loved. And some people think that's actually Lazarus. Um, Traditionally, we've said it's John, the writer of the book. But some people say, no, it's Lazarus. And part of that's because of something we'll read here in this story. But it's certainly people who are close to Jesus. And earlier in the chapter, we hear that he's sick and Jesus doesn't come to see them immediately. Jesus sort of takes his time. He tells his disciples, no, we'll get there. Don't don't worry about it, but we're not going to head out this second. And so he comes in a few days later and, and Lazarus is already gone. He's already passed. And the first thing that I notice, which is really important, and it may seem obvious, but is, is something we need to think about when we talk about conversations with those who are grieving, is this last sentence. They both hear that Jesus has come and Martha runs out to see him where Mary stays home. The reality is that not everybody grieves and mourns the same way. In this story, we have two sisters with similar experiences of Jesus who, when faced with this situation, one of them goes, yeah, I need to go talk to him and runs off. And the other's like, no, I'm staying home. It's really important that we have compassion for that. When we talk to people who mourn, um, part of the reason it's hard is it is not a one size fits all. If somebody tries to tell you the best way or the way to deal with somebody, I just don't think they're telling you the truth because there's not a best way. Uh, Even when I hear sometimes criticism of how it's done wrong, the reality is there's a few people in the world for the, the wrong way for one guy is the right way for another woman. Like 
sometimes that's how life is. And you can say something to one person that works really well and it doesn't work with another person. So having a sensitivity to that, having an understanding of that, asking for the Holy Spirit to guide you and give you wisdom and discernment. Uh, it may be true that generally many of us say too much in those moments, but we really have to get a sense of the needs. Here, Martha wants to be with Jesus. She wants to talk. Mary kind of wants to be left alone from what we can see. And that's true in real life. That'll be true within two family members who both lost a parent or a child or something like that. It just, it is different person by person. Lord, Martha said to Jesus, getting to him, if you had been here, my brother would not have died. But I know that even now, God will give you whatever you ask. Jesus said to her, your brother will rise again. Martha answered, I know he'll rise in the resurrection of the last day. Jesus said to her, I am the resurrection and the life. The one who believes in me will live, even though they die. And whoever lives by believing in me will never die. Do you believe this? Yes, Lord, she replied. I believe you're the Messiah, the Son of God, who has come into the world. Uh, first of all, I find it very interesting here that we see Martha just being active and and going. Uh, you know, like she clearly is dealing with her mourning by staying busy. There's this moment where she hears Jesus is there and she's like, I'm not sitting around this house anymore. Boom, I'm going to go talk to him. I'm going to go do something. And that is very true of many people when they are dealing with um, sorrow and suffering and mourning. Some people stay real busy. They think if they don't stop and think about things that it will be better. And, you know, a lot of times you got to kind of let them work that out of their system. If they're not ready to sit down and really consider things, then they're not ready. I also find it really interesting. Jesus has a theological conversation with her. He sits down and talks with her about the nature of resurrection and the nature of messiahship. Uh, this is a fascinating thing because this is something I hear a lot of people say never to do. I just, I'm not sure that's true because again, everybody is different. True, some people do not want to have their sorrow theologized. They do not want to hear their mourning put into the larger context of scripture. They want to just feel and that's fine. But there's other people who do really want to have a sense of how this fits into the bigger picture of God's work. Some people will be bothered by hearing uh, a message about how I know you're sad right now, but we'll see him again. But there's other people who really need to hear that. Martha is one. She quickly goes into this. She says, you know, if you'd been here, this would have been a problem, but... I know you can raise him again. I, it's interesting. It's almost like she's seeding in Jesus' mind. And they have this conversation. I, I think one thing we can see about what Jesus does here is though he goes into the bigger theological picture, he does so in pretty broad strokes. He does so by encouraging Martha to consider a personal experience of himself. And so for us, I think we say things when, when someone is in that place. Like, these are things we just bring to the feet of Jesus. This is a place where we just um, need to let Jesus hold us. Something like that. Encouraging people to live out um, that experience of being in the presence of Jesus. And also, um, you know, there's something generally here about resurrection. But, um, you know, Jesus does not go into like, well, where is technically Lazarus today? And how does the afterlife work? And is there a divine waiting room? Or does he believe in divine sleep? Or, or um, uh, uh, like a death sleep? Or, you know, what's paradise versus heaven? And uh, Or like some Catholic funerals that I've been to. Like, oh, we need to make sure we pray so that we can get him out of purgatory. There's none of that stuff. Jesus just says, I'm the resurrection. And if you're with me, you'll be okay. And that's enough for Martha in this moment. And it's probably, even if someone needs theology, enough for them in the moment to hear, I am with you, spend time with Jesus, and trust that ultimately all things will be made right. 
After she had said this, she went back and called her sister Mary. The teacher's here, she said, and he's asking for you. When Mary heard this, she got up quickly and went to him. Now Jesus had not yet entered the village, but was with all the people where Martha had met him. And when the Jews who had been with Mary in, uh, in the house, comforting her, noticed how quickly she got up and went out, they followed her, supposing that she was going to the tomb to mourn there. And when Mary reached the place where Jesus was and saw him, she fell at his feet and said, Lord, if you'd been here, my brother would not have died. When Jesus saw her weeping and the Jews who had come along with her also weeping, he was deeply moved in spirit and troubled. Where have you laid him? He asked. Come, they s come and see, Lord, they replied. And Jesus wept. I find it fascinating that Mary comes and she asks a very similar question to what was asked earlier. Uh, she says, if you'd been here, he wouldn't have died. And what's fascinating to me is that when faced with a very similar comment, Jesus reads the moment and realizes Mary does not need the I am the resurrection and I am the life talk. Jesus just says, hey, where's he buried? Let's go together. There's a lot in this story about presence that's really important. Uh, the unsung heroes of this story are all these mourners, all these people that came out from Jerusalem, that they're just sitting there and sort of sitting in the sorrow with their friend. And this is something that Jesus sort of joins in. In this moment with Mary, he's not going to try to fix her problems, not going to fix her concerns. They're just going to go and be at the tomb and they're going to cry together. And the passage then says that Jesus wept. Uh, you maybe know this passage. People always talk about how it's the shortest passage in the Bible. Um, that's a really weird English thing to be concerned about. And it's one of the shorter passages in the Greek uh, New Testament, but it's so short in English because of the way we translated it. But it is a powerful verse that Jesus in this moment is uh, sharing in the pain that Mary is experiencing. You know, I've heard a lot of people in my life try to hypothesize what Jesus is crying about. You'll hear people say things like, oh, does he regret that he didn't come earlier? Or is he crying because he has to raise Lazarus from the dead and he knows Lazarus would be happier to stay in heaven? Or is he crying because um, he's taught about the resurrection and yet nobody around him seems to understand it and they're still mourning uh, when they shouldn't be mourning because they were resurrection people. I mean, there's all of these sort of um, thoughts, you know, so people even ask, you know, is he crying because he's thinking about his own death and how difficult that is going to be? And I really do think a lot of that speculation is really wrongheaded. It is not the way we're supposed to look at this passage. And here's why. I think a lot of times when I hear people wonder why Jesus cried, they're kind of trying to get justification. There's like this idea, well, Jesus wouldn't have cried about the wrong thing. You know, Jesus understood the reality of resurrection. And while we weak humans maybe would cry at someone's death, Jesus would not cry just because a man died because he knew that Lazarus would be brought back to life. And somehow it's an affront on Jesus' foreknowledge or Jesus' um, understanding of the universe if Jesus were to be sad in this moment. And the reason I think all that is so wrong-headed is it sort of acts like we need theological permission to cry. That when we're sad, that we can't be sad about something just because we're sad. We have to put it through an exam, right? Like we have to do a seminarian uh, analysis of, our moment, of the moment to see if it's worthy to cry or not. And it's obviously ridiculous. I think that it is... Uh, very much overmade in this story. The reality, I think Jesus cries because everybody else around him is crying because his friends are sad. It's um, a much more visceral response. It's not a response that needs to be understood or to be processed. It is just Jesus saying, if you're sad, I'll be sad with you. How could he not in this moment seeing Mary and Martha, seeing their questions to him, 
seeing all these other people who are with him and supporting them. It's just a moment that you cry. And this is really important that uh, when people are mourning, just let them do it. Uh, it's something that we f sort of physically, emotionally, like have to do. Trying to rationalize it out doesn't often work when someone is truly in pain. They're just in pain. And so Jesus enters that moment with them and tries to cry alongside of them. As I've said, uh, this story ends with the re resurrection of Lazarus, and there's a lot of talk about the, the, the importance of resurrection in this story. We're not going to get into that today. In a way, it sort of ruins the story for our purposes this morning. See, when you talk to someone who is mourning, when you are with someone at a funeral, the likelihood is they will not jump up out of the casket. I've yet to be at a funeral where that happens. Uh, I'm not saying God can't do it. I'm just saying it's not been my experience so far. And so while resurrection is a great ending here and teaches us a lot about the nature of Jesus' ministry, it doesn't tell us a whole lot about how we deal with suffering. But I feel like these last two verses kind of do. Then the Jews said, see how he loved him. This is why people think the, the disciple Jesus loved was Lazarus. Lazarus, the only person that otherwise Jesus is described as loving in the book of John. They said, see how he loved him. But some of them said, could not he who opened the eyes of the blind man have kept this man from dying? This, this story, if you end it here, has this ambiguity we all have. People need to know when they're mourning that you love them. And they are probably going to be frustrated and sad and maybe even angry at God that it's happened. It's just the way death works. It's the way mourning works. It is sort of deep in our DNA. We know that God designed us for life. And when it ends, we inherently know that something is wrong. And so this is the way the story often ends is people say, oh, why did God let this happen? And hopefully they also say, oh, but look at how much their friends and the Lord loves them. And that's really our big purpose when we have conversations with people who are mourning. We want to say two really, really simple things. I'm here. I'm sorry. I love you. And in the same way, we also say either subtly or even non-verbally, but sometimes explicitly, Jesus is here and Jesus loves you and Jesus is sorry. See, the reality of Jesus weeping in this story is sort of a bigger point that Jesus, by becoming human, enters in to our sorrow and mourns with us, that we serve a mourning Jesus. Uh, I just thought about this. This was um, not in my sermon notes, right? I have a picture of it. There is a, a statue in Oklahoma City right across from the bombing site where the federal building was destroyed back in the 90s. Some of our younger members may not remember this, but it was a, um, you know, it was a domestic terrorist that had blown up a building in Oklahoma City that had federal offices. Uh, it was really a terrible, terrible situation. And there is a statue across the street now of Jesus mourning. And the idea is just that in the same way that we look at those tragedies and we're overcome by them, Jesus is too. And because of that, Jesus enters in. Jesus is present. This is really, you know, the big key to having conversations with those who mourn is not so much what you say, but the fact that you show up that you're present, that you're there. Because a lot of times we cannot talk our way out of the sorrow. We can only embrace it and experience it. And then hopefully that embrace then transforms it over time. Uh, it's my hope you don't have to have a conversation like this anytime soon. Mourning is not fun and none of us want to have to deal with it. But it is part of life. And I hope we learned a little bit from Jesus this morning in it. Uh, we can't do our core value time quite as fully as we usually do, 
Uh, obviously, dialogue. I'll be in the chat if you have a question. Feel free to pop it up there and I'll respond to it before I close my computer. So if you have one, that's great. You can put that in the Q&A. If you're watching this at a later time, you can always send us a message uh, at our church. That would be fine. Uh, as far as family, uh, we just want to pray for all of you in this hurricane. Uh, pray that things go well and that you are able to stay safe. That as few people lose power as possible, all those things. If you need anything, please, please uh, reach out and let us know. Uh, as far as generosity, two big things. Uh, first of all, be there next week. Show up to church and plan to stay late to give out school supplies. It's a huge act of generosity of your time. Also, if you'd like to give, you can do that. Feastprovidence.org slash give. That is possible for you online. We would love um, for you to do that. Honestly, in all the shuffle this week, I have not come up with a great uh, trajectory item. Um and so I guess the biggest thing is just uh, let's be uh, mindful of just a lot of things going on. A lot of people who are mourning this week, uh, pray for people who are sorrowful, people who live in Afghanistan, people who are affected by the hurricane, people that were affected by the earthquakes in Haiti. Um, just open your heart a little bit this week to people who have gone through um, some hard things. Uh, that's all I have. Let me pray for us. And then we have one more little scripture video as we leave. And uh, I, I pray that you have a safe day and we will see you soon next week for school supplies. God, I thank you so much uh, for the ways you care for us and for your love for us. I know that you are with us when we mourn. Please help us to be with others when they mourn. Help us stay safe through the storm and help um, as, as few disruptions as possible in people's lives. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. All right. Peace be with you guys.